Let's start with the federal budget that's just over two weeks away. The federal government this week launched a new strategy for that budget. Instead of releasing their new measures on the day of the budget, they plan to spend the next two weeks announcing nearly all of it before the document is even tabled. Earlier this month, Finance Minister Christian Freeland signaled the budget would focus on building a, quote, middle class life for the next generation. And that same message was reiterated this week. We have a plan to build a Canada that works better for you, where you can get ahead, where your hard work pays off, where you can buy a home, and where you can realize the incredible promise of our great country and get a fair chance at middle class life. So far, the budget announcements are focused on housing and more specifically on renters. The Liberals are pledging to create a new Canadian Renters Bill of Rights to require landlords to disclose their property's rental price history and launch a new $15 million tenant protection fund, as well as amend the Canadian Mortgage Charter to make your rent count towards your credit score. The measures are aimed at the bigger issue of affordability, an issue, though, the opposition accuses the Liberals of working against by increasing their price on carbon from $65 to $80 a ton on Monday. Jonathan Wilkinson is the Minister of Energy and he's with me now to talk more about that. Hi Minister, good to see you again. Thank you for making the time. Nice to see you, Vashi. Minister, I, I've listened very closely to your government's answers to the opposition and premiers this week on the price on carbon and the upcoming increase to that price. I've heard you and your colleagues say Canadians are getting more back in the rebate, therefore it isn't an affordability issue, and any politician that intimates otherwise is essentially lying to Canadians. If it isn't an affordability issue, why did you pause the tax for three years on home heating oil? Well, it is just true and it is a fact to say that 8 out of 10 Canadian families get more money back. Um, but the one exception to that was actually people who were living on home heating oil. Um, it is three to four times as costly as natural gas, depending on the province that you're in. Um, and it had escalated significantly. And certainly many of the folks that live on heating oil um, are living in, um, are in the lower income brackets. And so it was really important from an affordability perspective that we actually address that. And so what we are doing in the course of the pause on, not, not an elimination, a pause on the price on pollution, is providing free heat pumps to people so that they can actually save money going forward. So it was a different thing because people who by and large lived on heating oil were paying more. But that's not true of the vast majority of Canadians. But if, if the issue was the readiness and uh, sort of cost, cost of an alternative, why not just provide the alternative for free and increase the rebate? Was it just acquiescing to political pressure? Well, no, the rebate, the rebate is paid um, to people across a, a province. As you know, the, whatever is collected in a province is actually redistributed within a province. But it's redistributed on an average basis. And so those that actually were using home heating oil were significantly worse off than everyone else. So the pause was intended to relieve that pressure, but the program that actually provides the heat pump is intended to ensure that people can address that issue, address carbon emissions, reduce their energy costs. It will save many people thousands of dollars a year once they've installed the heat pump. So it was, it was really an affordability measure to address a particular case where there was a challenge because people on average um, who had home heating oil were not getting as much uh, back to cover the, uh, the home heating oil cost. But that's not true of natural gas. That's not true of electricity. Except the people who you've referenced more frequently this week, for example, to back up the point you just made, the 200 economists who signed that letter, some of them, in particular, Professor Chris Reagan, who was instrumental in designing the carbon price in the first place, actually said this about your decision to do so in Atlantic Canada or more largely with home heating oil. Uh, he said, carbon pricing works at low cost to reduce greenhouse gas emissions precisely because it lets the market, not politicians, identify low cost actions. When the federal government exempted home heating oil last fall, it weakened that principle and ignited a political firestorm. In addition, it created market uncertainty by setting expectations that future political challenges might lead to further policy erosion. Is he wrong? Well, I know Chris well, and, uh, and certainly I agree with the first part of his statement, which is it, it, all the data shows, and the 200 economists confirm, it is by far the most efficient, lowest cost way to reduce carbon emissions. So if you actually believe in the science of climate change and you want to reduce carbon emissions in a manner that is the least costly for taxpayers, it is a price on pollution. 
I obviously don't agree with Chris with respect to the home heating oil um, pause because that was a very specific case. You know, we came out of COVID, there was high inflation, um, then interest rates went up to, in order to curb inflation, affordability challenges became very, very acute. But, you know, go back to the beginning. Like, at, at the end of the day, people like Mr. Polyev, who make the argument that the, the price on pollution creates affordability challenges and doesn't reduce carbon emissions, I mean, 200 economists who are experts in the field say that is completely false. And there is one political leader in this country who has never had a job outside of sitting in the House of Commons is saying, don't listen to the experts. So, you know, uh, who should people believe? Well, I think it's pretty clear who people should believe. But the genesis of my questions of you and of the government is not what Mr. Polyev says. It's what the woman from New Brunswick sitting on the plane next to me a few days ago said in her worry about the degree to which the tax that your government is levying, she says, has disproportionately affected her. When you talk about, for example, the level of acuteness of the affordability crisis, what about small business owners, Indigenous people and farmers, three groups of people your government identified in 2019 as being disproportionately impacted? You were to save 10% of the revenue you took in from the carbon tax and redistribute it to those groups of people. $100 million of $2.5 billion has thus far flowed from your government to those groups. What about the affordability issues they face? Well, let me start by saying it is simply true that the vast majority of Canadians get more money back and it works exactly inverse to income so that it's the people that are most vulnerable get money back, get the most net money back. In terms of small businesses, there is money that will flow back to small businesses, hopefully to invest in energy efficiency improvements. There is money that is flowing back and will flow back to Indigenous communities. And that the same thing is true for, for the farming community. And in addition, with respect to the farming community, one of the things that is often not discussed is at the very beginning of the design of the tax, a number of on-farm fuels were actually excluded from the price. So the farming community actually has its own exemption that was built into the price from the very beginning. You haven't made no investments in those three groups, but the First Nations from Ontario are taking you to court because they do feel that they are continually more disproportionately impacted by the carbon tax. And that doesn't answer the question about where the $2.4 billion that your government is sitting on has gone and if it will, in fact, flow to the three groups you identified, and if so, when? As I say, the commitment has always been that the money that's collected will flow back. Um, it will flow back in the near term. Um, at the end of the day, it is important that small businesses are, uh, have an ability to address the, the, uh, the issues associated with paying the price on pollution, that there is a rebate. And certainly those that have actually accumulated with respect to small business will be returned. When will that happen? What does near term mean? respectfully, Minister. Well, I, as I say, it will be over the coming months. Uh, I don't have a specific date, and uh, and certainly you are very welcome to ask that question to the Minister of Finance, who is the, the minister that is actually responsible for administering it, um, but it will be in the near term. I will do so. I have uh, just one other issue to ask you about that is most distinctly in your purview, and that's around LNG. I spoke to Greece's Prime Minister on this program last year, and he said that Greece would quote unquote absolutely want Canadian LNG as Europe does try to displace Russian gas. Does that matter to you? Well, sure. Um, and, and to be honest, th there is a lot of LNG development going on largely on the west coast of Canada with LNG Canada, with, uh, with wood fiber, um, and with Cedar LNG, which have all um, been approved and are moving forward. Um, and, and that is uh, probably a simpler um, conversation than on the east coast because of the proximity of the gas fields to, uh, to where you would actually ship it from. You obviously have to do that in a manner that is consistent with Canada's climate plan. So you have to reduce methane emissions in the upstream and you need to liquefy using clean electricity. On the East Coast, we certainly have had many conversations about this with Premier Higgs and with others uh, about how could you get yourself into a position to export LNG from the East Coast of Canada to Europe, which would include Greece, obviously. Um, initially, the look was uh, uh, for the Repsol project and a couple of others bringing, uh, bringing gas all the way from Alberta. And what we found, and what Repsol found, as it did the economics, and I think Premier Higgs actually said this at committee today, was that that just wasn't economic. Um, but certainly, Premier Higgs, who has gas resources in New Brunswick, if he chose, chooses to develop them, could look to actually develop a project that could ship LNG um, to, uh, to uh, Europe. But obviously, that would need to be done in a manner that's consistent with New Brunswick's climate plan. Yeah, on principle, I guess I'm trying to, to figure out exactly uh, where your government falls, because there is a very live debate around whether or not 
you know, developing gas and exporting more of it helps get other places off more uh, emissions intensive resources or whether it adds overall to emissions because of the way in which it's developed and the fact that it is gas and, and not a renewable, um, a renewable resource. And so I'm wondering, like, for example, the U.S. has decided to press pause on uh, developing export capacity because of the potential climate impacts. I is that the posture of your government? Like, are, are you gung-ho about gas or are you, you know, falling in line with the concern that adding more export capacity beyond what's on the table right now would negatively impact climate targets? So, I mean, the pause in the United States is actually so they can assess how it fits mm -hmm. overall within the context of their commitments on climate. Um, we actually did that years ago. So the Americans are actually following in Canada's footsteps. And what we have said is you have to do a lot to reduce emissions of methane in the upstream. And we're bringing in place regulations to require 75 percent reductions. You have to actually liquefy using electricity, clean electricity. You can't just burn natural gas in order to liquefy or the carbon footprint that you leave is far too large. So we've already done that work. And what I would say is, as we move forward, there is a role for LNG in displacing heavier hydrocarbons like coal in some jurisdictions. Um, but folks who are looking to make the investment, and this is the private sector that has to make this assessment, need to also look at the timelines that are involved and how long it takes them to make back their money. Your opponents have characterized your position on this as ideologically opposed to exporting a resource that we have. How do you respond to that characterization? Are you? Well, I would, no, I, I would say we, we've actually got three projects uh, that are actually moving forward in Western Canada. We work very closely with Premier Higgs on the Repsol project, and the company came to the, the uh, understanding that the, the project economics, unfortunately, just didn't work. Um, but we also have a commitment to ensure that Canada is achieving its net zero goals, and so it's got to be within that frame. We support the work that can be done to displace heavier hydrocarbons, but it's got to be within a frame that actually fits with respect to the commitments we and others have made. Just one quick final question on what that support looks like. Uh, will the government invest taxpayer dollars or subsidize the process of electrification for proponents that want your government to essentially fund that process? So we have said um, that, uh, that the government is opposed to using government money to fund inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. We're the first country in the world to actually do that. We are not interested in investing in, uh, in LNG facilities. That's the role of the private sector. They need to assess the business case and make the investments. Okay, Minister, I'll leave it on that note. Thank you for your time as always. Thank you.